Or do you want to review it? She's like, should I just email it to you? I'm like, no, you're coming over. <laughs> so I was a little demanding. Oh, so you're not going for services. Oh, I am. Yeah, I'm going to them. Oh. But, you know, you used to leave. And stuff so like. he's not coming over. He is going for service. He's coming over to review it first, and then. I'm right here. <laughs> okay. Systems. Um, we define uh, transformations between curvilinear systems and the Cartesian system, general one, and uh, we define uh, a metric tensor and a way to use the metric tensor to determine when a system is orthogonal or not, which will make a huge difference at the time of calculating things such as uh, what we're doing now, which are the differential. Uh, arc length, differential area, which we already did, and now we're going to do the differential volume. And then, uh, towards the end of the lecture today, we're going to look at how to calculate gradients and divergences and Laplace and curls uh, used on curvilinear systems. Um, okay, so let me see. Here we are. So we're looking at, actually, we did differential. Areas, but we didn't do any examples, right? Yeah, we yeah. stopped. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna do some examples of differential areas. So differential area example. For example, the uh, cylindrical coordinate system. We have the actual coordinate, and we have the radial coordinate R, and we have a tangential coordinate and we call this one theta. And let's just try to reproduce this one here. Let's see uh, the different differential areas in this coordinate system. Um, so, for example, in the perimetry, we'll have That is a piece of a surface that is at a constant R value. So this will be dsr or ds1 if we call this the first of the three coordinates. Okay? This is basically a piece of the this is a piece here of the actual coordinate, and this arc here is a piece of the tangential coordinate. Okay? go paddle this way, we'll see this differential surface right here. This will be ds theta, which is simply also ds2, where theta is the second coordinate. So this is a piece of the axial coordinate times a piece of the radial coordinate. And let's say on this top plane right here, of an arc length of the tangential coordinate. This is ds0. 
D. D is 3. Recall that the 1, 2, 3 nomenclature is because x1 is equal to r, x2 is equal to theta, and x3 is equal to z. Okay? Remember also the back transformation. Back word transform is uh, x is equal to r cosine of theta, y is equal to r sine of theta, and c is just equal to c. That's the transformation between cylindrical system to the Cartesian system. That's why we call it backwards or back transformation. All right? We already determined that for this system, gij is equal to zero when i is different than j. So the metric tensor is a diagonal metric, matrix or diagonal tensor. Therefore, system is orthogonal. System is orthogonal. We've already determined that GRR, or we can call it G11, is equal to 1. X1 is equal to R, and therefore HR, which is equal to H1, is equal to 1. already determined that g theta theta or g22 is equal to r squared x2 is equal to theta and the scale factor is equal to the square root of that which is just r and gcc which is equal to g33 is equal to 1 x3 is equal to z hz equal to h3 is equal to 1. The three differential areas ds r, again, which is equal to ds1, would be h2 times h3 times dx2 times dx3 which is equal to r d theta dz. So the size of the surface area of a differential surface that is at a constant value of r is equal to r d theta dz. ds theta, which is equal to ds2, is equal to h1, h3, dx1, dx3, that's just simply the R dz. That's this one right here. And dsz is equal to ds3 is equal to h1, h2, dx1, dx2 is equal to R d theta dr or R d R d theta. So now if we're integrating in the cylindrical coordinate system and you're confronted with the situation of an area integral. Depending on where that area is, if it's in the RZ plane or the R theta plane or the C theta plane, you have to use any of these differential areas. Right here, that's what the differential area element means. Like for instance, what is the perimeter or the perimetral surface of a cylinder of radius r and height? Perimetral surface of a cylinder that doesn't include the top and the bottom, just the perimetral surface will be SR. 
That will be the integral over a surface dsr. And dsr, as stated here, is r d theta dc. So we have to integrate over theta and over z, or over z and over theta, r d theta dz. We're in the theta direction, the full loop is 0 to 2 pi, and in the z direction, we're integrating from 0 to h, so it's the height. Right? And that's when r is equal to r. We're told that the radius is equal to r, and since there is no integration with respect to r, we just simply solve through, and this is 2 pi r h. That's directly the perimetral surface, the perimetral area of a, of a cylinder. Radius r, height h. Okay. Now in the spherical coordinate system, spherical coordinate system, we have, let me see if I can do this, Z, Y, So we have right. So if we go periphery here, any distance from the origin will be the radial coordinate. This angle right here with respect to the z-axis is what we call the azimuthal angle, theta. And the angle of the projection of r into the xy plane with respect the x axis, we call that the equatorial angle. The angle with respect to the plane is the equatorial angle. So in the spherical coordinate system, we have a length coordinate, that's r, and two angular coordinates, theta and phi. And the order is actually r phi theta. So this is the radius or radial coordinate. This is the equatorial angle. Easy to remember because it's the angle with respect to the plane. And theta is the azimuthal angle. So the backward transformation between Cartesian and spherical looks like this, x, sorry, yeah, is uh, equal to r cosine of phi sine of theta, y is equal to r sine of phi sine of theta, and z is equal to r times the cosine of Yes, you move on. Right. Such that x1 is equal to r, x2 is equal to phi, and x3 is equal to theta. Right. All right. So we can, as per our formulation last lecture, we can calculate the elements of the metric tensor. 
For example, GRR, that's the first element or element 1, 1 of the metric tensor. That's equal to, remember we need the backward transformation to be able to calculate these things, is dx dr times dx dr, dy dr times dy dr, so on and so forth. So I'm just going to write it as dx dr squared plus dy dr squared plus dz dr squared. So grr, you can see. Uh, dx dr, what is it? Cosine phi, sine theta, squared. dy dr, sine phi, sine theta, squared. And dz dr is cosine theta, squared. So grr. So you can see, uh, you can take sine squared here as a common factor. This will be sine squared of theta times cosine squared of theta plus sine squared um, of phi, I'm sorry, plus a cosine squared of phi, theta. GRR is equal to 1. So that term in parentheses becomes 1. And then sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is also 1. So the metric tensor, the first element of the metric tensor is 1. We're yet to determine whether this is an orthogonal system. That, that would mean that the off-diagonal elements are all 0. And if so, then the square root of these will be the, the scale factor, hr, or h1. All right. Let's do uh, g, p, phi. That would be dx, d, phi, square plus dy, d, phi square plus dz dz square g p phi is equal to so the first with respect to phi is equal to minus r sine of phi sine of theta square the second y with respect to phi will be plus r cosine phi sine theta squared, and z with respect to phi is zero. So g phi phi is equal to, I think, the r squared as a common factor. And I can take uh, the sine squared as a common factor. And then this will be sine square of phi plus cosine square of phi, which is equal to 1. And therefore, g phi phi is equal to r squared sine squared of theta. And you can see how the spherical coordinate system starts getting complicated because of those scale factors or those elements of the metric tensor that would require them to be on the surface areas differential surface areas and later on the differential operator. All right. Then finally G theta theta, which is dx d theta plus dy d theta plus dz d theta g theta theta is equal to x with respect to theta would be r cosine phi cosine theta squared y with respect to theta would be r 
sine phi cosine theta squared. And C with respect to theta would be minus r sine theta squared. Here I can take r squared cosine squared of theta as a common factor. And this will be uh, cosine square of phi plus sine square of phi plus r squared sine square of theta. And that leads to g theta theta being equal to r squared. We have one, r squared sine squared theta, and r squared, and we need to determine the off-diagonals too. Okay? So, but I'm not going to do it. I can tell you here we can show that g r theta, g r phi, and g um, theta or phi theta are all equal to zero. And remember this matrix, the tensor is always symmetric. So g r theta is always equal to g theta r. And the fact that they're all equal to zero, that means that the spherical system is orthogonal. So that means that GRR is equal to 1, HR is equal to 1. If G phi phi is equal to R squared sine squared of theta, H phi is equal to R sine of theta. And if G theta theta is equal to R squared, H theta is equal to R. Also means that D S R is equal to H phi H theta D phi D theta, which is equal to R squared sine of theta D phi D theta. So a differential surface at a constant value of R that will be in the periphery of a sphere will measure that much. R square sine theta, d phi d theta. So if you need to integrate anything on the periphery of a sphere, that is a differential surface. Likewise, d s phi is equal to h r, h theta, d r, d theta, and that would be equal to r, d r, d theta. And ds theta is equal to h phi, h r, d r, d phi. And that's equal to r sine theta, d r, d phi. Just the same way we solve an example to calculate this experimental surface area <coughs> of a cylinder, we can do the same on a sphere. What is, e.g., what is the surface area of a sphere of radius? Right? 
So that would be S R is equal to the integral over the surface D S R. That would be the integral of the integral of the differential surface, which is R squared sine of theta d phi d theta. And we need the limit of integration of phi and theta to complete a full circle. All right, so if we go back to the sphere, or a full, a full sphere, phi phi is the equatorial angle. For a full sphere, this one needs to rotate 180 degrees. Okay? And the azimuthal angle only needs to go 180 degrees, phi. Okay? If we rotate this one 180 degrees and rotate the azimuthal angle 100 and the equatorial angle 360 degrees, we'll be completing the full sphere. We cannot rotate both 2 pi or 360 degrees. That will be twice. We'll be rolling twice over the surface of the sphere. Right? So this one will be from 0 to 2 pi. That's phi. And theta will be from 0 to pi. So the azimuthal angle limits are always 0 to pi for a full sphere. All right, so, and, I, and this r evaluated at big r. So, the r comes out as r squared, then we need to take the integral of nothing with respect to phi, of one with respect to phi, that's phi, evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, that's 2 pi. So that would be 2 pi times the integral from 0 to pi of the sine of theta d theta. So I've already taken the integral with respect to phi. We turn that into 2 pi. And that would be the integral of sine is minus the cosine, right? So that would be 2 pi r squared times minus the cosine of theta from 0 to pi. We evaluate the cosine of pi, we get minus 1. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. And we evaluate the cosine of uh, 0, we get pi. And I'm sorry, we get 1. So it will be minus, minus 1. Um, so this will be 4 pi. 4 pi the surface area of a sphere of radius r. All right. So we need to evaluate also the differential volume. Three. So we did the differential arc length. If we need to do a line integral, differential surface, if we need to do a surface integral, and differential volume, in case we need to do a volume integral, and any coordinate system, so uh, let's start with the, with the tangent vectors of the curvilinear system, A1. kind of a cube there with curvilinear axis. The differential volume, there's a single one, 
not like the differential surface, so it depends on what plane you're in. The differential volume is the determinant of A1 dotted into A2 cross A3, dx1, dx2, dx3, whatever those three are. And you can show that this, element, this uh, right here is just the determinant of the GIG, GIJ tensor. So dv is therefore the square root of the determinant of the GIJ tensor, of the metric tensor, times dx1, dx2, and dx3. And this also we can call a Jacobian. In this case, this is a Jacobian of the volume transformation from or an, on a particular coordinate system. <coughs> so the Jacobian J is a square root of the determinant of the GIJ tensor. <coughs> such that this determinant of the GIJ tensor is equal to, if this is GIJ, J11, oh, I'm sorry, J, G11, G12, G13, G21, G22, G23, G31, G32, G33, to calculate the determinant of this matrix, can do a plug. You can do it whichever way you want to. When I like the way, the way I like is to augment the matrix using the first two columns. G22 and G32. And remember, multiply the diagonals and add them up. And then subtract the counter diagonals. You notice that if system x1, x2, x3 is orthogonal, then gij is equal to 0 or j different than i. And if that's the case, then that determinant comes out to be just G11 times G22 times G33. It's just the first diagonal there. Everything else cancels out. There's an off diagonal on every one of those multiplications. And the Jacobian in the square root of this determinant of GIJ is the square root of all these, which happens to be H1 times H2 times H3, just the scale factor. So for orthogonal systems, the differential volume is equal to H1, H2, H3 times dx1, dx2, dx3. That's easy enough. If it's not orthogonal, it's just the determinant of this matrix right here, or the square root of that. So if we need to do, for example, volume of a cylinder of radius r and height.
write H the volume of the cylinder will be the integral over the volume of the differential volume. And that will be the integral of the integral of the integrals of hr, h theta, hc, dr, d theta, dz. That's the differential volume is that much. Remember that this one's 1, this one's r, and this one's 1. And the limits of integration of r, well, from 0 to r. The limits of integration on theta from 0 to 2 pi. And the limits of integration in z from 0 to h. So the volume, the integral from 0 to h, the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to r, of r dr d theta dz, you can see that that would be r squared over 2. And we will integrate over pi, we get that times 2 pi. And then when we integrate over z, we get that times h. So the volume is equal to pi r squared times h, which is the cross section times the height. We, we knew that before we started. But now, if we need to integrate anything over the volume, like for example, if we need to apply, say, Gauss divergency theorem, and that would be the divergency of a vector field, right? A velocity field, whatever is crossing through, through there, through that cylinder, then uh, remember that the differential volume is r dr d theta dz. So you need to stick an r there because of the size of the differential control volume. Likewise, if you're doing this on a sphere, volume of a sphere of radius r. So, volume of a sphere is equal to the integral over the volume of the sphere dv, which is equal to the integral of the integral of the integral of h r h v h theta um, d r, let's start with r, d v, d theta. This one one, this one right here is r sine theta, and this one right here is r. And the limits of integration in r, we have 0 to r. The limits of integration uh, on phi, that's the uh, equatorial angle 0 to 2 pi, and on theta being the azimuthal angle 0 to pi. So the volume of the sphere is equal to the integral from 0 to pi, of the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to r, of r squared sine theta, dr, dv, d theta. steps, the integral of r squared, that would be r cubed over 3, evaluated between 0 and r, times the sine of theta, d phi d theta. So there's nothing there that's a function of phi, 
So this will be the integral from 0 to pi of 2 pi r cubed over 3 d theta. Oops, I forgot the sign. Sine of theta d theta. The volume of the sphere is now 2 pi r cubed over 3 times minus the cosine of theta evaluated between 0 and 5. And that's 2. So the volume of the sphere is equal to 4 pi r cubed over 3. So, let me, uh, let me go to a different page, please. Are there any questions so far? So, calculating integrals and curvilinear systems, it's just a matter of adding or imposing the right limits of integration and imposing the right differential surface or differential volume which is not as straightforward as in Cartesian systems, obviously. All right, so why are we doing this? This is all part of uh, vector field theory. Vector field th theory included the formulation of these differential operators and integral identities. And all these integral identities had vector operators, differential operators embedded in them. And uh, well, we need to know how to do this, not only in Cartesian, Cartesian coordinate systems, we need to do them do this in general curvilinear system. So we have to find a way of evaluating gradients, divergency, Laplacian, and curls in orthogonal. So we're going to restrict the calculation of these operations to orthogonal for linear systems. So it's not generalized, it's just for it's generalized but only for orthogonal ones. All right, so let's start with the gradient. Let's say that the grad of phi which we've simplified to be nabla phi. Right? Well, at least we found that nabla phi or del phi is the case in Cartesian coordinates. Let's see what it comes out if this is expressed in other coordinate systems. And we know for a fact that if we take the gradient of a scalar function, that will lead to a vector function f1, e1, f2, e2, f3, e3. Okay, remember the gradient turns a scalar into a vector. We know how to do this in Cartesian coordinates, it's straightforward. Just every one of those f1, f2, f3 is a partial derivative with respect to x, y, and z. Well, remember that dr is equal to dr dx1 times dx1 plus dr dx2 times dx2 dr, dx3, and dx3. That is a differential of the position vector r in curvilinear coordinates. If the system is orthogonal, or orthogonal systems, or orthogonal systems, 
dr reduces to simply h1 e1 dx1 plus h2 e2 dx2 plus h3 e3 dx3. Then we can express the differential of phi as the gradient of phi dotted into dr. So if we dot these vector into this vector, then the differential of phi will come out as h1 f1 dx1 plus h2 f2 dx2 plus h3 f3 dx3, where again f1, f2, f3 are the three components of the gradient of that function, which is what we're looking for. But d phi is, by chain rule, is d phi dx1 dx1 plus d phi dx2 dx2 plus d phi dx3 dx3. So by simple expansion, inspection, compare these two. So by inspection, we can find that F1 is equal to 1 over H1 times d phi dx1. F2 is 1 over H2, d phi dx2, and F3 is 1 over H3, d phi dx3. Okay? So that's it. Those are the three components of the gradient of a scalar F. So let's recast. Given a scalar function phi, the grad of phi, which can be short term as nabla phi or del phi, remember not, no dot in between, the dot induced and implies divergency. It would be 1 over h1 d phi dx1 in the first direction, 1 over h2 d phi dh dx2 in the second direction, plus 1 over h3 d phi dx3 in the third direction. And that is the gradient of a scalar, which is a vector. The gradient of a scalar is a vector, but that's now expressed in a general orthogonal curvilinear coordinate system. As long as you know the scale factors, h1, h2, h3, that's all you need. Examples, but we will write the particular form for cylindrical and spherical systems, which are the two main curvilinear coordinate systems. So, e.g., cylindrical. So, given a function phi, that's a function of r, theta, and z, cylindrical coordinates, such that hr is equal to 1, that's h1, h theta is equal to r, and hz is equal to 1. The grad of phi, which is also the same thing as del phi, or nabla phi, is d phi dr, 
in the r direction plus 1 over r e phi d theta in the theta direction plus e phi dz in the d direction. That's it. So you have to remember to put in that 1 over r there in the second coordinate. Otherwise, it's incorrect. So as you can see, the only difference between taking the gradient and Cartesian coordinates and the cylindrical coordinates is this 1 over r right here. Everything else is identical. You just differentiate with respect to each of the coordinates in each of the directions. Right. E.g. spherical. Even, well, a phi, a scalar phi will be a wrong choice. We must say a scalar f in r phi theta. So we're given a scalar function f, and with the dependency r phi and theta, remember that. The scale factors hr is equal to 1, um, h phi is r sine of theta, and h theta is equal to r. So now the grad of f, which is del f, is equal to the f the r in the r direction plus 1 over r sine of theta times the f d phi in the phi direction plus 1 over r the f d theta in the theta direction. That's taking the gradient in spherical coordinates, which is considerably different now. Still, we need to take the partial derivatives with respect to each of the coordinates, but we have those scale factors there. Okay, so that's how we take the gradient of a scalar <coughs> function. How about the divergency? Remember, we're talking, we're not talking about generalized curvilinear coordinate systems, we're talking about just the orthogonal curvilinear coordinate systems. So recall that the divergency of a vector v, so given a vector v, now that vector can be expressed in terms of any coordinate system, is we said that it was del dot v, at least it came out that way in the Cartesian system. So we use this as a nickname for these, although in reality it's just this. Remember that the definition comes from the limit when delta v goes to zero of one over delta v of the surface, the total surface integral of v dot n ds. So we need to integrate over a differential volume and over all the faces of a differential volume. That's how we defined it. That's how we actually formulated the divergency. We did it over a differential cube and look at every phase of this differential cube and split this integral into six because we have six phases to a cube and 
look at the delta B of the differential cube is delta X, delta Y, delta Z. Everything ended up canceling out. So, and we ended up with a form for the, the divergency of the vector V. The divergency of the vector V ended up being, remember, dVx dx plus dVy dy plus dV dz, where vx dy dz dz are the three components of V. All right. I'm not going to go through the demonstration. I'll leave the demonstration for Tuesday because it's a review. But I'm going to tell you that if V happens to be V1 in the first direction plus V2 in the second direction plus V3 in the third direction, then the divergency of V, which is also known as delta B, is equal to 1 over H1, H2, H3 times D dx1 of H2, H3, V1 plus D dx2 times H1, H3, V2 plus D dx3, H1, H2, V3. You'll have to take the partial derivatives of each of the components with respect to the corresponding variable, but we have to stick the scale factors inside that partial derivative. Okay, so that's it. Again, I have a full demonstration here, but I'm going to do that on Tuesday as a review for the test. Okay. So, essentially, um, say for example, e.g., in, in cylindrical coordinates, say that uh, well, V is equal to VR in the R direction plus V theta in the theta direction and VZ in the Z direction such that remember HR is equal to 1, H theta is equal to R and HZ is equal to 1. and we stick the scale factors in there, and the divergency of these vector, whatever that vector is, with those components, which can also be expressed as delta B, is equal to 1 over R, D D R of R V R plus um, 1 over R of D V theta, d theta plus d v z d z. Okay. Let's see. Uh, let's do this and. Spherical. In spherical coordinates, we have V is VR in the R direction plus V phi in the phi direction plus V theta in the theta direction such that HR is equal to 1, H phi is equal to R sine of theta, and H theta is equal to R. So this is going to be a little messy. Divergency of V, which is also delta V, is equal to, okay, 
under our square sine, and that would be h two h three, and the sine theta goes with the sine of theta, so that would be one over r square times h two h three. That's r square d d r of r square b r. That's the first term. The second term will be uh, with respect to phi of h1 and h3. So that would be h1, h3. That would be 1 over r sine of theta d d phi of b phi. And the third one, plus, that would be H1, H2, that would be R, so that would be uh, 1 over uh, R sine of theta. D, D theta of sine of theta D theta. And that's how you take the divergence here. Of a vector. And as you can see, it's considerably different. So the Laplace. Laplace. Well, that one's simple because the Laplace of a function phi is equal to the divergency of the gradient of phi is equal to del dot graph phi, which can be shorthanded as del square phi. So the Laplace of phi is equal to 1 over h1, h2, h3, d, dx1, of h2, h3 over h1, d phi dx1. So there's where the second derivatives come into play. Plus d dx2 of h1, h3 over h2, d phi dx2, plus d dx3, h1, h2 over h3, d phi dx3. That's the Laplace. Okay. So, in cylindrical coordinates, If I give you phi as a function of r, theta, and z, and recall that hr is equal to 1, h theta is equal to r, and hz is equal to 1, so the three scale factors, the Laplace of phi is equal to 1 over r, d dr, r, d phi dr, plus 1 over r squared, that's the second derivative of phi with respect to theta squared, plus the second derivative of phi with respect to z squared. That's 
cylindrical corners. And spherical corners, I'll leave it up to you. But it's just a mess of scale factors there in the middle that you have to worry about. All right, one more. Finally, the curl. Remember that the curl, the curl of a vector field V, which we found out to be del cross V, is defined as the limit when delta V goes to zero as 1 over delta V of the integral over the surface of N cross V ds. And we went over a full demonstration of how that turned out to be del cross V. So this is the definition of the curl. And we found out using a small differential control volume that that turns out to be del cross V. No, we can use Stokes' theorem for that. But at the end, I have a full demonstration here in, cor in curvilinear coordinates. So we use a curvilinear differential volume. But at the end of the day, it turns out to be this, the curl of V. So again, given V as V1, E1, plus V2, E2, plus V3, E3, the curl of V, which is also del cross V, is equal to 1 over H1, H2, H3. There again, the scale factors are everywhere. Times the determinant of a matrix that looks like H1, E1, H2, E2, H3, E3. Um, D, dx1, d, dx2, d, dx3, h1, v1, h2, v2, h3, v3. And calculating that determinant, you can do it by augmenting the columns, or the rows, whichever way you learn how to take determinants. There it is. So now we know how to take gradients, divergences, Laplace, and curls in any orthogonal, as long as it is orthogonal, we know how to take those. And, uh, and that's it. So you have any, everything you need to complete that homework. Okay? At least uh, with what we had on vector field theory, you could do until problem number five or six. And the last few problems, you need uh, this theory of curvilinear coordinates. Any questions? All right. So have a nice weekend, and I'll see you on Tuesday, where we are going to just have a little review for the test on stars. Okay? And we're going to talk about what the test is about. Excuse me.